you've got your Bibles open to Jonah. That brought some excitement. I like that. I like Jonah. I'm going to I'm going to kind of tag off of um uh, uh Brandon's sermon last week. If you hadn't got a chance to listen to that, uh, uh go online and and, t- and take a listen. It's worth your time. Um He talked to us last week about humility and um you know, as I read Jonah through and as I'm studying Jonah, um, there's a lot of things that came to mind that I've never really uh, tied with Jonah. Jonah. Jonah is an incredible book that describes a lot of things, but mostly it describes that salvation comes through the Lord, that he, he's our salvation. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. I'll do what you've told me to do, Jonah says, from the fish. Because salvation is of the Lord. What a time to proclaim that, right? Now, we're going to read a little bit of the story, of Jonah, but I just want to talk to you a minute about the practicality of it and make sure that we can apply all this to everyday, everyday life. So the first thing that you really need to come to conclusion with as you study Jonah is whether you really believe that Jonah had the experience that he had. Now, so oftentimes people come against this book because, you know, they they have this problem with with him being able to survive being swallowed by a giant fish and the fact uh, that that he continues this ministry and goes on to preach. So so with that, let's think about the history of Jonah as, as, he, as he is living his life. First of all, you've got to know that Jonah wrote the book of Jonah. And this is a testimony of Jonah. One of the things that encourages me is that, it, it, you know, it ends so abruptly as if God is saying this and then I, I just didn't get it. Jo- Jonah kind, kind of ends that way. You know, he's still angry, it looks like. But what Jonah is doing is describing his condition. And, and, and how God dealt with his condition of sin. And so it's going to apply to every believer, and we'll see that in just a minute. But, but he, so, so you know the story, right? Jonah gets, gets instruction from God. He says, God, I, I don't really want to do that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, it says he flees the presence of God. He's on a ship. He's ignoring God. He's sleeping. He's so comfortable with himself ignoring God that he can sleep. And in that process, God stirs up a a, a temptuous storm. You know, uh, he he stirs up this huge storm to get Jonah's attention. They figure out that Jonah's the problem. They throw him off the boat Jonah at Jonah's instruction. A giant fish is instructed by God to swallow Jonah. He does. He's in the belly for three days. In Matthew and in Luke, Jesus refers to Jonah as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, the great fish, so I will be in that. While Jonah's in the belly of this fish, he describes it as hell. Even though I was cast down to Sheol, to to the depths of hell and death itself, God was my salvation. Jesus is quoting that and saying that's what he's going to do. He is going to provide a way of salvation for all of mankind. And so he quotes this deal. When Jonah is in the belly of the well, he repents. He says, okay, God, I'm going to do what you told me to do because you're the God of my salvation. And so he's vomited up on the shore, and then he goes on to do exactly what God said to do. God's instruction when Jonah gets out on the shore is the same instruction that he got beforehand. Now, the problem is that it's not so much that people don't believe in what kind of miracles they are, but what people have a hard time with is the kind of God they want to believe in. And whether he is able to instruct the well, whether he is able to 
cause the, the, the storm, whether he is able to instruct a fish to swallow a man, instruct a fish to throw the man up on shore, and instruct a man to actually do the ministry. So it's not about whether they believe in, a, in the miracle. It's whether they believe in a God that does that. And so when we look at Jonah, there are really three things that I think we need to understand about the book of Jonah. The first one is God is sovereign over all things. And secondly, he, well, this is still part of the first one. God is sovereign, and he's burdened over the lost condition of the world. Number two, God's grace is sufficient for the worst of people and needed by the best of people. Isn't that good? Jonah was a believer. Jonah was a man of God, and he needed the miraculous of God. And the third thing we need to take from this story is that God's love, it never gives up. You know, right now it's really popular that God leaves the 99 and go gets the one. But the best for me, the best story of humility and being humbled and walking in humility and surrender is the story of Jonah and what happens at Nineveh. So let's read real quickly. We're going to read through, we're going to read chapter 1, and we're going to read through verse 9 in chapter 2. So it's a good little bit, but um, I think it'll be worth it. Let's follow together. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Say that with me. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, cry out against it. Their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee, (laughs) but, circle but, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went into the ship to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lost parts of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. That's kind of funny. They did that in the New Testament too. You know? Then they said to him, Please tell us, for, for the lot fell to Jonah, Please tell us for whose cause is this trouble coming upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid for, for, and said to him, why, are you, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them that. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous and he said to them pick up and throw me into the sea pick me up and throw me in the ocean then the sea will will become calm for you for I know that this great tempest is because of me nevertheless the men rode hard to return to land but they could not for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them therefore they cried out to the Lord and said We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. Say that with me. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly. He said this, 
I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Y'all need to circle that right there. That is so huge for a believer. The water surrounded me even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth was, the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought me up. You have brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord, my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remember the Lord, and my prayer went up to you. Into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols, they forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving from the, from the belly of a fish. I will pay what I have vowed. I will do what I have been called to do. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish. Then it vomited Jonah up on dry land. Let's say this. Say this with me. And the Lord, and the Lord spoke to the fish. <clears throat> yeah. There's so many things that we can learn from this passage of Scripture. First of all, the reason that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh was because there were people there that he didn't like. There were people there that he knew were wicked. And he had already passed judgment on these people. He had already had a hard heart toward this people. He, he didn't have the heart of God towards this group of people, this people group. And so he also knew that the mercy of God was humongous. And he didn't want that mercy to be applied to this group of people. Now, I just I want to I want to come at you with a few things. First of all, J Jonah get, didn't get in the, this condition. Um, he he it, it took him a while. This is not an overnight condition. This is most likely a pattern of his heart that it had had go, gone for most of his life. He he has quoted in Second Kings. He has talked about in Second Kings as a man when they brought the word of the Lord, it came true, and he had a reputation of speaking the word of God and that actually being carried out. So when he brought that word to Nineveh, the king himself recognized his apostate condition as a Jew and, and declared in the whole nation to repent and fast before God and maybe God would have mercy upon them. And the whole city, 120,000 plus people, put on sackcloth and ashes and repented before God. And it says about the people of Nineveh that God saw their repentant heart and he saved them. Now, in this whole condition, Jonah is a picture of somebody who is leaving the presence of God doing his own thing because he knows better than God. And then he gets swallowed up by his condition and he's thrown out on the shore and he still has to do the same thing God called him to do in the very beginning. And, it, and the people of Nineveh can see that this is who they are. They're the ones who turn from the presence of God and begin to do things their own way. But God is the God of salvation. And so Jonah, with his life story and his, his reputation of being a God-fearing man, and being one who could prophesy, and it actually came true, in the midst of that reputation still had to be dealt with by a merciful God. And he still needed salvation to come to his life because of his predetermined heart condition. And if there's anything, any message that the church needs to hear today is that we predetermine our heart condition for so long and for so many years that sometimes God really has to shake us up to get our attention, to get us on track so that he can bring salvation to the way we think and the way we judge. 
And God's heart is for a lost people, for his lost world. And our job is not to judge them, but to love them. There seems to be a theme here. And they weren't humble before God, but they did humble themselves before God. And as soon as they did, God saved them because his desire was to save them. This week, the Lord just showed me so much about my my personal condition. And some of the heartfelt things that I've had on my heart and a way of thinking that really was contrary to his. Sometimes, sometimes what we do is we take our best asset We take what we do best, and we impose that on the people that we love, expecting them to perform at the level that we can perform at in that given thing. Does that make sense? Did I explain that well? We hold that on them, and then when they don't do that, (laughs) we judge them. We judge them for not being able to perform at a level in something that I'm very good at. And the Lord says, listen, I don't want you to judge like that. I don't want you to respond to people like that, ever, because my heart is for the lost. I want to bring salvation to everybody. And so there's a lot of things that we can see in this this journey of Jonah that we need to pay attention to. The first thing is that the word of the Lord, it came to Jonah. Let's say that out loud. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. And this is true about you. The word of the Lord this week came to Pastor Alex. Not about this message, but about my condition. That's why it's so important that we understand that God's grace is for those who are wicked and for those who are following him. We are being transformed. We will be transformed. We have been transformed and we are being transformed. Let me do it in order. We have been transformed. We are being transformed and we will be transformed. As long as we're aware that God wants to give us a word and direct our path. And so he he brings the word to Jonah, and he says this. Let's just read the first few verses again real quick. He, he, He brings the word, and it came to Jonah, and he said, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. Now, I want you to understand that you don't, have to change your message. You have to change your heart toward the people that you're bringing the message. He never changed the message. He says, I, the instruction was to cry out against them for their wickedness has come before me. And so this is what you need to understand. Regardless of where you're following God or whether you're a total heathen, your wickedness comes before God. Jonah's wickedness came before God. And, and, and Jonah leaves the presence of God, leaves the way of God, leaves the instruction for God because he didn't want to carry that instruction out because it was hard and he'd already passed judgment on these folks anyhow. And Jonah makes a tough decision. But, it says in verse 3, Jonah arose to flee from the presence of the Lord. And then God made a great tempest come. From the moment, listen, from the moment that Jonah said but, you need to hear this. This is, this is deep, but you need to hear it. From the moment you say but, you're outside the presence of God. 
from the moment you say, but I'm going to do something different than what you've instructed me to do by your word, you're outside the presence of God. His hand is off of you. Are you still saved? Was Jonah still saved? Yes. But he was on his own. And so God's going to rock your boat to try to get your attention to come back into his presence, to, again, line up with the word of God, to the ways of God. And if, he, if his hand being off of you and rocking the boat is not enough, then he's going to throw you overboard, and you're going to think you're going to die. And you're gonna, he's going to get your attention. This is why I love this story so much. It's, it's better than the, the leaving the 99 and going to get the one because Jonah, he is, can you imagine the, the panic and the distraughtness that comes from drowning and, and, and not being able to see the shore and being in this sea that is more and more, whatever that word is, that big old long word. A really stormy sea. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Tempestuous. That makes you sound educated. <laughs> but he'll rock, he'll, he'll, he'll rock your world and then he'll make you panic. And then he'll make you wish you were dead. Right? I mean, do you see progression? Until you say, okay, God. I repent. I'll do exactly what you told me to do. You are the God of my salvation. Your way is right. I'll choose it. And God says, good. Now, go do what I told you to do from the very beginning. Do what I told you to do to start with. Now, how many don't want to go through the storm? How many don't want to be swallowed by life and have to be spit up on the shore? The choice is not to, not to leave the presence of God, not to allow his hand to be taken from you, to continue walking in him. So that means that you have to look at things the way God looks at things. And that means you can't hold people accountable to your standard of living or what you're good at. When I mean accountable, I mean you can't have expectations on others that say if they don't respond like this, then I'm not going to have anything to do with them. He's saying you need to respond to everyone the way I respond to you so just maybe they'll repent. And you don't especially want evil to come upon them. And if we have to examine our own hearts and we really are honest about where our heart condition is, sometimes we don't care about things bad enough because of the hurt we've gone through in certain situations that we kind of do want them to get smited. I wish God would just smite this person to get their stinking attention. Because we don't like them, and we're mad at them, and they hurt us. And they're not living up to our standard. <laughs> That's messing with everybody. <laughs> Listen. God's been messing with me, so I'm going to mess with y'all. <laughs> God will take his hand off your life to get your attention. You're still saved, but he says, okay, you go. He, he let Jonah go, but then he'll cause trouble to get your attention, and then he'll expose your sin. And then you'll have to deal with your sin, which is a good thing. But as soon as you do, then he'll destroy you. And then he'll use you for what he intended to use you all along. 
how we respond to his word exposes our heart condition. And so this is what I think the Lord wants to deal with today. And I think the number one thing that he wants to deal with today is family hurt. There are people in your families that have hurt you, that you're mad at, that you don't like very much, that have an opinion of you that, or a situation or whatever might have occurred in some way that caused deep pain. And you've already passed judgment on them. And you've given up on them. Now, I'm not saying I want you to go do anything. I'm saying that you need to have the heart that God wants you to have for that family member so that just by somehow, some way, they may receive the mercy of God. Because you don't want hellish judgment on anybody that's in your family. I don't care how bad they've been to you. And there needs to be a release of that this morning. That we need to come to a place of forgiveness and hope that the mercy of God is going to come upon those family members. The second thing that we need to do is get rid of every piece of church hurt that we've ever had. There should be never, we should never walk in church hurt and let it rule in our hearts ever. No matter what, you should never have passed judgment on a church and expect them to live up to your standard. You should hope that that church receives the mercy of God. That pastor, that leader, whoever it might be, that because of your posture and position, because of your voice, because of the love of God that comes through you, when we know the lost condition of certain situations because of the standard we raised in our own hot life or our own value system this is what we value this is what i value in a church and they don't they don't live to the same value system and therefore i'm passing judgment on what they're doing god says stop that family hurt church hurt and the last one is authority hurt In the workplace, fathers, mothers, aunts, uncles, it kind of blends into family, but it's just authority. That we have been wronged by people in authority over us, and therefore we view authority with tainted vision. We we have a we have a hard time with authority because what we've seen has been broken. And we've already passed judgment on that authority. And there are some people in the room that need to get rid of the idea that they wish that person in authority would go to hell. And just get what they deserve. And God says, no. I want you to go to Nineveh because their wickedness has come up before me. And I want you to bring them a message that if they don't repent, they're, they're going to be destroyed. And just maybe they'll repent. Now, be careful how you, this is a different culture, be careful how you present that. But it has to be presented out of love. Even though Jonah, uh, Jonah didn't necessarily do that very well, by the end of his message, he learned his condition. His sin was exposed, and he was corrected by God. So in this process, our sins are going to be exposed. And you have to be, be being corrected by God so that your heart is true to what he wants us to be. What he said about 
Jonah. Jesus said, listen, I'm going to provide what the picture you see in Jonah where salvation came to the Jonah when he was in the midst of hell. And what happened at Nineveh because of his testimony, I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Sheol for three days. And then I'm going to raise up. Now, who do you think raised Jesus from the dead? And the Father spoke. <laughs> Don't know exactly how this goes about. Can't, can't get my hands around it. But it was a command. And Jesus was raised. Sent the angel, sent the messengers. Jesus is raised from the dead. So that we can be free from what burdened Jonah and from what burdened Nineveh. Our wickedness comes before God. Our sins will be exposed, and we can be set free because of what Jesus did as he mimicked Jonah. And you can be the Jonah in the lives of all those around you if you'll carry the message of love to them without prejudging their condition. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just ask you to show us. Why don't you just ask the Lord with me right now? Father, show me where I harbor bitterness and unforgiveness, where I've prejudged where I've set a standard of what I'm good at and imposed it on somebody else's performance. Let me not flee from your presence when you show me. I don't want to run. I don't want your hand to be removed from me. I don't want to storm. I want to choose. I want to humble myself before you, God, up front. Let me do it today. In Jesus' name.